I'll just give a quick overview of everybody, and then um, when you talk, you can give some more detail. Here we have uh, Steve Van Trees, uh, who used to be my manager when I was in Air 130, uh, and uh, has been a, a key person in, in UAS. Um, and you know what? I'm not even going to get the detail about who they are. I'll let you guys handle that. Uh, next to him is Wes Ryan uh, from uh, Kansas City, he's a smaller plane directorate. Uh, and um, it is officially called the UAS directorate, too? Or no? Not yet. Okay. Right now it's just a small. Okay, right now it's a small airplane director. Right there. Uh, Everett Roshan from AFS A20, is that right? Uh, Flight Standards, who is uh, key in the uh, small aircraft, small UAS role, uh, and Ely Nasser uh, from AFS 240. So, uh, is that right? Yeah, okay. So, those are our four panelists on stage, not human factors specialists, uh, although Wes knows quite a bit about human factors. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, in the front row of the human factors specialists, uh, starting on this side, we have Sherry Chapel, who works in my office as a uh, program manager for human factors research and has been involved with a lot of UAS work. Um, uh, Phil Smith from The Ohio State University. I had to put the V in there. Uh, and is uh, uh, also a um, UAS Center of Excellence uh, representative. Uh, we have Lisa Fern from NASA, uh, been one of the key people in the DAA work going on and with SD228. Uh, Valley Gauron, um, I, although I'm not sure if I get that spelling or the pronunciation, yeah, Gauron. Uh, Valerie is from MITRE, uh, and um, we have uh, uh, Jeff Morrison from the Office of Naval Research. Um, I think uh, a lot of what uh, Mark Draper said will uh, maybe you can touch upon that. Uh, regarding autonomy and everything. Uh, Kevin Williams from the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute, CAMI, we call it CAMI, in Oklahoma City. Uh, I've been working with Kevin for a really long time as well on all sorts of UAS stuff. Steve Plischka from the UAS Integration Office, uh, the only uh, one in the FAA that has uh, uh, got the official UAS and human factors label. Uh, and so uh, I'm glad to have Steve here too. Uh, and uh, Wes Olson from Lincoln Lab. Uh, Wes does a lot of work with uh, uh, TCAS and ACAS and, uh, and also some of the DA work as well. And um, so that's the human factor specialists. I think uh, there's no one else in the crowd that needs to move up, I don't think. I think that's everybody. So uh, Steve Van Trees, why don't we uh, start with you and just, where's the, oh, of course, Kathy. Sorry, yeah, I didn't see you. <laughs> Kathy Abbott, okay, so Kathy Abbott is, uh, I didn't see because you weren't sitting down. Um, you, you can come up here. Um, <laughs> I kind of forgot. Um, the, the agreement with Kathy was that, that we were going to uh, sort of uh, moderate this t together. Um, she was on the agenda as a panelist, but uh, um, before we start with Steve, I'll just uh, do you want to say a few words about, uh, about who you are and, and um, anything uh, that I didn't say already? <laughs> I was trying to sneak out of the room. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. No, I'm just, kidding. Yeah. just kidding. I'm Kathy Abbott. I'm the FAA's Chief Scientific and Technical Advisor for Flight Deck Human Factors. Um, and even though it says Flight Deck, that also applies to UAS. At least I would certainly think that that is the case. Uh, I thought the last panel was very, very interesting and uh, very useful to hear the summary of that. One of the things I'm just going to put out there since you gave me the opportunity to talk is the FAA has something that they call a safety continuum to recognize that uh, the same level of safety doesn't necessarily apply to every type of vehicle, every type of operation, and every type of airspace. So I guess one of the things I would hope that this panel would talk about is maybe how that gets applied in UAS. So I'll leave it with that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, something for Wes to chew on at least. Um, so, okay, we'll start with uh, Steve Van Trees. And uh, all of you, you know, if you want to take a few minutes and, like I said, talk about uh, who you are and what your world is, and, um, and then we can have the discussion when you get all done with this panel. Good. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Thanks, thanks Bill. Yeah, as I, uh, as I go through my career, one of my greatest claims is going to be the people I've hired. So Bill is up leading the, uh, leading the symposium, and uh, Steve George, 
was my uh, was my first lead for UAS in uh, 2007. Air 130 had, was the uh, only UAS office in the in the FAA. So it's come a long way since then. I spent my entire FAA career, 19 years, next week in uh, Air 130 aircraft cert. We do cross far part policy and. Uh, Com nav and surveillance. I've always been a com guy. I came in as a data communications engineer and have um, worked worked UAS. The uh, originally part of kind of the early JPDO efforts, and then uh, had a big part on the Sherry McGarrett's FAA UAS conops, and uh, stayed with it since then. Ed Ed Wagner gave me a nice. Uh, set up coming in that together with NASA and a tremendous number of industry people, I've been on um, leading role with SC-228, the UAS Detect and Avoid and Command and Control Committee at RTCA the last uh, three years. And it was, it was formed after, after SC-203, SC-203 tried to do everything in the world for all airspace and all sizes of aircraft, and then the way the FAA does, our ambitions contracted a lot, and we said, okay, let's just do, just do two mops, let's just get a bunch of engineers and send them over there. So that's, that's what we did. And three years ago, we had said, we're gonna have the command and control mops at the end of July 2016. I'm happy to report we're gonna be a day early of our schedule three days ago. We're, NASA is uh, producing the document this afternoon, and we're sending it to RTCA. So we've we have kept kept schedule, and part of it, as we talk about human factors, is that document is about 50 pages of standard and about 750 pages of how we how we got there. I mean, what the what the maps on top of the mops were. So the I guess one of the one of the things we learned in in uh, 228 was how much human factors there was even in the initial system allocation. You know that we uh, we come to something and we say, okay, well, what kind of what kind of link do you need? And what we had to do was go over to working group one, and we had to ask them a set of set of questions. You know, and and really heavy human factors flavor first. What's your detect and avoid automation architecture? You know, what are you trying to do? Is the pilot in the loop? You know, is the pilot on the loop? Is it, is it autonomous, right? And that, that, that drives you to very different communications choices. If you can, if you, you know, you need a link made of spun gold, or you can lose the link because you know the automation has it. You also look at what the uh, what the lost link automation architecture is. You know, do you return to base? Do you have no fly? Areas programmed, or is it is it cooperative? You know, and the Wes and I have have talked about this for years. What's your air ground automation? You know, distribution. You know, is it all on the ground? You know, is some on the aircraft and some on the ground? You know, Wes has said he doesn't want us hand flying the aircraft such that we we lose the link. We've automatically got a flyaway that the uh, aircraft has to continue in safe flight on on loss of link. And uh, on the on the other hand, you've got a Steve George that will tell you that you can't you can't rely exclusively on automation for for detect and avoid. You can't just you know put put TCAS directly to the autopilot and you decide that's you know how you're how you're going to keep flying. That that certainly isn't isn't the way we're going. So that even driving. Uh, Driving toward what the what the link had to be, what the performance parameters were, what we could get out of CNL band. That was that was really the uh, beginning of it. And and so the whole the whole question from an aircraft cert perspective is, um, we don't much care how well it works. We really care a lot about how badly you get hurt when it fails. You know, so that if. Um, if you lose the control link, you know we uh, we think that's 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 probably hazardous unless you unless you mitigate it. You know we think if you lose the comm link, that's that's major to hazardous. And uh, 
Wes, yeah, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear from him next, but is very much on the idea that, you know, you, you've got to mitigate it down. You know, people are going to be coming in wanting to fly, wanting to do operations, and you can't, you can't depend on, you know, one, one piece of automation in that, uh, in that aspect. So we, um, I think the, the, the other thing that's been, been clear is we, um, what, what 228 did exclusively, we are, we are exclusively up and away. We are not UTM traffic. We are, you know, class D, E, and G transitioning to class A to do work. We are not uh, mixing in that traffic, except obviously you have to, if you came up, you've got to get down. There is um, some interaction, but the, um, one, of our, one of our greatest challenges is what what does the demographics look like? What does the rest of the world look like? You know, and uh, Part 107 and beyond is getting a lot of the action, but we also believe that there's going to be action in in large UAS, which is where where 228 is going. And we, um, I think, I think the other thing to um, keep an aspect of part of my part of my day job is still data communications, and I was. Uh, I was talking to the NTSB, and they really, they have a, I'm sure you know this, they have an old uh, recommendation on UAS, the uh, Predator B mishap, but they are, uh, they are intensely interested in, in what we're doing, you know, and so if we, uh, if we have something like adding data link communications that trips the you know, recording requirement. They're they're really interested in in seeing us do that. So there are a lot of there are a lot of aspects um, in this that that inter intertwine. And I think the um, the the other thing is is um, I, I, is how much um, the com group had to integrate with all of the. Uh, all of the other aspects of 228, and really all the uh, all the rest of the agency. You know, we spent a lot of time with uh, flight standards. We spent a lot of time with Spectrum. We spent a lot of time with uh, you know the real aircraft service. They say not the not the headquarters guys. And so I would um, I would absolutely uh, I would absolutely stress that. And um, one one final we. Uh, we're going immediately into phase two, so that the uh, working group one is, um, you know, they've done a massive, bigger job than we had, a massive job on detect and avoid. Now looking at ground-based uh, detect and avoid is a complement to that. And we are moving to phase two. We had a rousing discussion about uh, how many international organizations think we're late already, which is great. That's just the way to start, start new work, but we, um, we have the next couple of years work for um, putting this over SATCOM, looking at networking, and so there are a lot of uh, the to what extent the performance of our link is acceptable for what for what working group one is trying to do, and for what with the rest the rest of what a UAS has to do. So good. Well, I always I always learn more by listening. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it to Wes. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, well, again, I'll, I'll say thank you to the organizers of the uh, workshop here today and just uh, say thanks for a few minutes here to just kind of give the group a little background on who I am and what I'm doing in the aircraft uh, service related to unmanned aircraft systems and then also kind of go through just some uh, key areas that I think really need some attention and how we might be able to do that together. So um, I've, I've been in uh, the FA for about almost 15 years now. Uh, I came to the FA from uh, a job that I had uh, that had me out at NASA Dryden for a while, now NASA Armstrong, working on some of the X-planes and, and some advanced flight control systems and advanced technology. So when I came into the FAA, um, I went right into the small airplane directorate's efforts to try to revitalize general aviation through the use of technology to leverage technology to enhance safety. So I've been really lucky because I'm, I've been at the forefront of a lot of activities over the last 14 years, 15 years, um, to bring new technology safely into our existing system, whether it's integrating glass displays into general aviation aircraft or taking a new regulatory approach with the light sport program that we did 
uh, to use industry standards as a basis for certification instead of uh, a heavy-handed approach by the FAA. And so we've seen a lot of really you know, great things come in the door in the small airplane directorate, and we've taken some new and novel approaches to making those things work. And uh, through that whole process, I have continually seen the benefit of what I would call judicious or appropriate application of human factors in the development of new technologies from the very beginning or the integration of a technology into the operational aspects of an aircraft or even after the fact in investigating, you know, some safety issue with a, a technology. Uh, human factors, you know, I believe have, plays a key role in every aspect of what we do if it's, if it's applied uh, appropriately. And um, so to that end, I guess what I'd like to talk about today is how we in this symposium and this group can talk about how human factors plays a role in the certification side anyway of human factors uh, for UAS, which is where my particular interests lie. And you know, the three kind of key uh, pieces of the puzzle that I see. Um, one is, is how we apply a risk-based approach to certification. Uh, and Kathy had mentioned it, but our idea of this um, safety continuum, it's really just to say that we can't use the same approach for every type of product that we certify. And therefore, our certification approach and the requirements that we apply have to be scalable. And uh, so this risk-based approach to certification has been put into action in the regulatory structure we're creating for unmanned aircraft systems from the small low-risk 107 rule that's just coming out to potentially some changes to Part 21 to allow us to handle some of the medium-sized uh, UAS through uh, a process where the industry is showing compliance to standards but the FAA still takes kind of a hands, a light touch, not, not a hands off approach, but a light touch approach. And then for the larger aircraft, certainly using all of our existing procedures, <coughs> all of our existing certification processes, getting involved early on to make sure that uh, that human machine interface is designed properly. Um, and, so, and it was mentioned in the earlier panel too that we have a challenge of looking at existing designs and looking at new designs. And so uh, there's, there's really a, a lot to be mind out of that area of, of how we judiciously apply our known human factors uh, requirements to existing designs, how we think outside the box to potentially accommodate new human and machine interface uh, ideas and things like that. So uh, the, the other piece besides the risk-based approach to CERT that I'd like to talk about a little bit um, is how we can start planning ahead. Um, you know, and that really ties into our research and development discussions and how we can kind of prepare for uh, the future. And uh, there's unique needs for the unmanned aircraft, uh, human and machine interface, for remote pilotage, for the displays, for things like that. Um, but we need all that to be applied in a timely manner. So unfortunately, as was mentioned on the first panel, we're sort of in this idea of reverse dog years where one year in UAS time is worth like seven years in real world time. And uh, underneath that challenge, we have to make sure we're putting requirements in place for evaluating the human factors for unmanned aircraft systems uh, in, in place in a timely manner. And I, I hope we're learning lessons along the way from the industry, from the Air Force, from uh, even from the consumer products industry where they are designing human machine interfaces that don't meet any of our existing requirements but might be perfectly intuitive for a, a person to pick up and use. So, um, you know, that's that's just kind of planning for the future. and then. Looking way down the road, how does our long-term automation strategy um, from an unmanned aircraft systems perspective, how can some of those technologies, some of those human machine interfaces be used to potentially revolutionize the way we all fly? And if you think about um, some of the concepts that NASA has with their on-demand mobility, um, they're, they're really relying on uh, flight controls, uh, human, you know, human machine interface automation to all get to a point where we have like an Uber aircraft where you can be a passenger on an aircraft and have it come pick you up and fly you somewhere and land. So obviously that's way off in the future. But if we don't think today about how we're, where we wanna be in 10 years or 20 years, and we don't start putting the, the stepping stones in place to get us from our existing system to that future goal, we're not gonna get there. And um, you know, a great example I have is the uh, Agate program that was done over almost 30 years ago now with NASA and the FAA to look at how to revolutionize general aviation. A lot of the concepts that are just commonplace now, the big moving map displays, the big wide format um, uh, attitude indicator displays, the 
GPS technology, uh, the advanced autopilot with envelope protection, all of those things were envisioned during the Agate program 30 years ago, and it took us that long to implement all this stuff. So, you know, this last piece of the puzzle I'm thinking about of the advanced automation and future transportation goals, I think there's a lot of things that can be, you know, brought to fruition there. So I'll just quickly kind of touch on each one. Um, the risk-based decision-making process that we're using, um, you, you may be aware of the Part 23 rewrite that we did. Um, it's in process right now. Um, what we did for those regulations is we pulled the regulatory requirement up to the very top level safety goal. So I want the human factors community to be thinking about how to term, how to put our requirements for human factors in to a, the context of the top level safety goal rather than always focusing on does it meet the basic T or is red the right color to use in this particular instance. I want to you know, be thinking about what the top level safety goal is and how we can put those type of top level requirements in place because we are aware of the fact that sometimes our uh, very prescriptive regulations can almost become an, uh, a hindrance to advancements. Having said that, we also recognize if we completely destroy the boundaries that we're used to, we can have escapes from safety, we can have problems come into the system that we didn't envision. So we have to be very careful about how we kind of restructure things and how we take this risk-based approach to certification. Um, we have a unique ability right now to use the small unmanned aircraft community as a prototyping community for some of these ideas. So, you know, it really presents us the opportunity to put new technologies out there in a low risk, um, you know, very structured, almost segregated, as was mentioned earlier, operational construct, gain operational familiarity with those, gain uh, familiarity with the technology, and then allow those things to evolve to uh, a higher level of criticality and use in our transportation system moving forward. So just making sure we're thinking about scalability, the right level of involvement at the right time during product development for human factors, and um, thinking about new solutions to a typical problem. Um, those are things that I would encourage. Um, the, the kind of el elaborating a little bit on the, the second point, which was, you know, how can we prepare for the future and, and be looking ahead? Um, the, uh, each stage of development of a product, whether it's a conceptual design on paper, it's the first time you're doing a flight test article, or you have an operational system that's going into wide usage in the NAS, there are human factors aspects that can be applied at each one of those steps. Um, during the basic development of a product, you're looking at you know, the basics of human-machine interface. What does the aircraft do when you lose link? Those kinds of things that Steve has mentioned. Um, but then along as you evolve the product, there are new, new things that need to be looked at. How do you integrate hundreds or, or tens of thousands of aircraft into an existing NAS in a safe manner? Um, and, and sometimes these things are going to require us to think outside of the box. I think of our current cell phones, if you look at them, we don't have rotary dial technology on the face of our nice, you know, screens on our phones, right? We went to the touch screens, well, I, or the touchpad. But I remember when the old phones, when I was a kid, went from rotary to a, the touch, you know, the, the keypad. And it was such a huge revolution to not have to sit there and wait for the rotor, you know, to go back each time. It seems, it seems like a very simple thing. But what if, by constraining ourselves to some of our current paradigms, we're inadvertently sticking to the rotary dial design instead of thinking of something that's outside of the box. So that's just my, uh, one of my silly examples that I could use of thinking, uh, looking towards the future. Um, and then lastly, this, this sort of future concept for, for automation. Um, I really have great interest in this particular area of what can happen for the future of aviation based on how we apply human factors now and plan for the future. I, I personally believe the technologies that we're prototyping in unmanned aircraft systems today will be the key for us solving all of our loss of control accidents for GA aircraft, a lot of our potentially loss of control accidents in larger aircraft, um, our traffic separation issues. A lot of those things could be uh, you know, handled through judicious use of automation where the pilot is still part of the decision-making process and flying the aircraft maybe through the system and aware of, of the issues going on, um, so not completely autonomous, but you know, allowing the pilot to be a better pilot because of the automation, or allowing air traffic controllers to be better controllers using the automation. Um, one of the th key areas that we're dealing with right now that is very real to me is for manned and unma unmanned aircraft systems, we have companies that are coming in with vertical takeoff and landing type of um, uh, configurations where the aircraft is meant to 
vertically take off with electric propulsion, multi-rotor type configurations, distributed lift, to be able to do a transition to fly horizontally at high speed, get you where do you want to go, and then land again. And everybody thinks that's something that's 10 years away. Well, we actually have two applicants who are at the small airplane directorate today that are knocking on our door saying, we'd like to certify this in the next five years. So um, there is a lot of you know, human factors activity that can be done during the unmanned aircraft small you know, subscale prototyping of those types of aircraft, and then the large scale integration of those kinds of aircraft. And it was mentioned in the earlier panel as well, but it's, it's a reality in this, this same construct is uh, pilot skill level. For a highly automated aircraft like that where you get in, you fly it, and it takes off vertically and transitions and flies you to where you want to go and then lands again, do we really need a private pilot to be able to fly that? Or do we need a system monitor that's got a big red button that says if something goes wrong, they push it and a ballistic parachute pops out and they land safely on the ground? So there's two extremes there. One is no pilot skill necessary except pushing a button. The other extreme is hand flying the aircraft through a very unstable, you know, vertical transition type of mode, which would we rather have the pilot doing? Do we want the automation to do it? Do we want the pilot to do it? So these are all things that could be looked at from a human factor standpoint. So I know some of that's kind of far out there, um, but that's kind of, I'm, I'm known for a little bit of that far out <laughs> type of thinking, but I do appreciate the, the little bit of time to kind of introduce some of my concepts and look forward to questions we might get during the discussion, thanks. Excellent. So uh, I thank you um, as well for me to uh, this opportunity to, to speak to you all. I, I, I feel like a relative uh, infant up here with the, uh, the level of experience uh, here in the FAA and, um, and certainly from a technical background. I've, um, I've been with the FAA only six years, uh, but I'm certainly not an infant, as you could tell by the, uh, the gray here in my, in my beard. But, um, so again, Everett Roshan, I'm with uh, Flight Standards and General Aviation and Commercial Division. Um, specifically, I'm with the AFS 820, which is the Commercial Operations Branch. I'm kind of dual-hatted right now, so um, one hat uh, I wear as the, the branch manager and a AFS 820 just from a, a normal day-to-day -day operations um, if you're not familiar, uh, is uh, from a manned operations perspective, covers everything from uh, Part 91 uh, piston aircraft to um, Part 125 sized aircraft, 757s, um, flown in uh, various types of uh, private operations. So, um, you know, basically just about everything that. Um, you know, fixed wing and rotor craft that is not, um, that does not fit under the air carrier um, umbrella. So um, that, that's kind of my, my day job, if you will, or was, but um, until I got plucked out of relative obscurity to, um, for, the, for the part 107 rule. <laughs> and um, so, and it, and it literally happened like that. I mean, it was, um, you know, there was, a, I think there was some discussion here about the continuum of you know, how, uh, how UAS, you know, I think it transitioned from air and then to um, AFS-80 and then, you know, and then the, from an OPR ship of, um, and policy lead when it comes to, to UAS, it has um, it transitioned over to, to AFS-800. So that's kind of how I, I came into it. And it was literally, um, you know, one day I was, I was at work and, and um, you know, there was, you know, activity going on with the um, with the rule and um, and and direction it needed to take, and um, and my boss kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, "Okay, you got it." And um, so um, next thing you know, I'm on telecons and everything else, and then and then I, I end up heading over to the office of rulemaking, and um, to kind of you know figure out, okay, what's this 107 rule where it is going? I've been familiar with UAS and the and the um, the rulemaking activity. Um, you know, but but a little bit more from a distance. We kind of were looking at it like, hey, AFS 80's got that. You know, just let us know when it kind of starts to interfere with this manned operations thing we got going over here. We're kind of comfortable with our manned operations hat. You know, so you guys kind of deal with that UAS stuff. But um, it you know it did you know transition. It was like you know it, the the head of Fly Sanders said, hey, you know AFS 800, you have it from a policy perspective and. And so, you know, over there at the office of rulemaking, they said, you have it, you gotta make this happen. And then, so I called up a buddy of mine 
Um, and I said, hey, you know, we, we've got this tiger by the tail now. Let's, let's take it. And um, I had him come over. We sat in the, um, the, the office of the rulemaking conference room, and we were there for literally the next four or five months and didn't leave. So that's kind of how we got involved in it. Um, so I guess I'm partially credit, partially blame for whatever you don't like about the UAS rule at this point. But, but so right now I'm kind of working um, um, really rulemaking and implementation from a, uh, from a flight standards uh, perspective. Uh, so forgive me if my uh, perspective is a little bore scoped on that um, because that's really been my life the last, the last year or so. Um, is, is everything having to do with the small UAS rule and how to, to turn it into a reality, um, you know, for, for operations on August 29th when the rule becomes effective. So a lot of bits and pieces there, um, you know, everything from uh, the guidance material, uh, pilot certification, training, um, y you name it. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of a multifaceted effort and the, and the biggest challenge we have um, upcoming, um, not just when the rule becomes effective on 29 August, uh, of making sure that we have pilots certificated who can conduct operations under the small rule. But it's it's this this idea of the waiver the waiver provisions. So um, so it's it's very very dynamic. I think it's almost going to be an ongoing rulemaking effort in that regard. Um, from a from a human factors perspective, me personally, I I'm a I'm a pilot and um, an operator background coming from the, from the military, from the Navy, and through the airlines. Uh, then I worked uh, flight simulator programs at the Pentagon for the Air Force. And I remember the day when UAS and those associated operations started showing up in the discussions uh, there at, um, at Air Force headquarters and, um, and, and remembering what a, what a tough nut it was to crack, how to, how to integrate these, these operations into that, that man world. And as man pilots, it's really difficult to take that hat off and to, to look at this, this new paradigm. But, um, you know, so, um, you know, so from an operator's perspective, from a pilot's perspective, I certainly have training and background um, um, when it comes to, um, to human factors and the effect on operations and safety. So I'm, I'm equally interested um, in it from a, from a UAS perspective. How are we going to take, you know, Wes was I mean, his, talking about his forward looking and, and uh, I don't know what term you use, pie in the sky or whatever you would. Could be. Could be. <laughs> but um, how do you turn that into an, an operational um, reality? So all of the things he was doing with his hands about lifting and transitioning and all this other stuff. So I guess we've got to figure out how we're going to actually make that happen from a, from a policy perspective um, in AFS 800. So, um, so looking forward to to speaking to you all and, and absorbing what you have to offer to help us in that regard. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, when Bill stopped by my office a couple weeks ago and uh, explained to me what we're doing today, I kind of had a little bit of a, a pause uh, on whether I should be the one sitting here or someone else from uh, AFS 200, but it didn't take much convincing Basically, I'm here for selfish reasons, first of all. I want to learn more about what we're doing as a group because it seemed like the last um, year or so I've been involved in this type of, uh, in this project. Uh, I, I see a lot of people working hard. It's just maybe we need to, uh, you know, get to collaborate a little bit closely with each other. A little bit about my background, kind of like uh, uh, Everett mentioned, I'm a pilot. I've been a pilot since 1985. Uh, I don't consider myself an old timer, but years add up of what? That's 31 years, right? Mm. Uh, so I've been a pilot all my life, uh, my professional life, uh, a little bit in the military, a little bit in civilian, and then I joined the FAA in 1997. So that's also a, a, a big chunk of years. But uh, all my uh, assignments, all my work activities had nothing to do with UAS, uh, primarily uh, flying airplanes, inspecting operators, certifying pilots and airplanes and that kind of stuff. I had a, a, a period of time when I did international work um, in flight standards. We used to assess um, civil aviation authorities. Uh, so I had the pleasure of visiting a lot of countries and dealing with their uh, traditional system safety oversight at 
nothing related to UAS other than some of them didn't have any uh, qualified personnel, so we called them unmanned operations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the last, uh, last July, I came back to flight standards from an assignment in Russia. I was uh, the FAA senior rep in uh, Moscow. A lot of excellent exposure to a million other topics, such as national security, geopolitical issues, airspace, cross-polar, but had nothing to do with UAS. So my involvement in UAS has been since I came back to a flight standards AFS 200, the Air Transportation Division, and my branch is the new programs uh, branch. So basically this fit under the new programs. So, and um, I'm lucky in my branch and in the division that we have the right people for this project, for this conversation. We have human factors experts, we have uh, unmanned uh, aircraft experts that actually worked in AFS uh, 80 before the transition. So we have the right people. However, <clears throat> I don't, you know, a big disclaimer that we're learning about the technical aspect of UAS uh, aircraft, UA, the, the aircraft part of it, and the air traffic part of it. And uh, what I have to say is that everything that we will do in the future as AFS 200 in the air transportation uh, business will be based on the work that's being done by, we'll go in this direction, by 800, because they're, gonna, they're the focal uh, division for flight standards when it comes to the foundation of pilot aircraft uh, operations, qualifications uh, required to operate a UAS. And, you know, air traffic folks, aircraft certification folks, I was talking to Wes about some of their projects that they're working on. It's just, uh, you know, the, the technology is moving so fast, it's, it's not really feasible for us to set a certain set of requirements and then before, before you know it, you know, the technology is way beyond what you, what you imagined. So uh, somebody, someone mentioned that this is like um, the uh, invention is the mother of necessity. So you invent it and then we'll find a use for it instead of the uh, other way around. So we don't know what we don't know. Uh, however, our shop has, we've worked hard with, uh, uh, you know, human factors, research and development with all the LOBs, you know, 800, AFS 800, AFS 400, the uh, UAS office, even NASA and, you know, the outside the industry folks uh, on staying connected with this conversation. We cannot just go away and say, when you're done, let us know, we'll start talking air transportation. We are engaged. We, I have people that have nothing to do but telecons every day, all day long, from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, and all. Yeah. So basically, we have certain uh, concepts that we, we believe they're going to work regardless. Air transportation, like in manned operation, it's a, a step beyond just operations under Part 91, let's say, of a manned aircraft. So when 800 decides, okay, for a pilot or for an operator of a UAS size, qual qualifications, capabilities, you need X, Y, Z. Then to fly or to operate that UAS uh, in air transportation for car uh, air carrier type, for uh, compensation or hire to take uh, a package or cargo or even a person, passenger in the future from point A to point B, that takes it to the next level of the highest level of safety that we're obligated to maintain. So on top of the requirements, the basic requirements that we will get, we will take a look at the rules. Current rules are 119, 135, and part 121 that enables air carrier type operations. Uh, we will either update those rules to include UAS type requirements or we'll just uh, uh, design, develop a new set of regulation that applies to UAS. So that's in, a, in general what the, you know, our frame of mind. We have few operators that are already applying for a Part 135 type operation. If some of them uh, applied, we went through the motion, we just talked with them a little bit, we had group discussions, and then they decided with the brand new 107 
uh, rule, they don't need a 135 type or 135 like uh, authorization or certificate. Some, a couple of them are still in the system pursuing a 135 uh, certificate using UAS. So what we're doing, just so you know, I mean, for the sake of this conversation, we're more on uh, the process right now rather than the technical aspect of UAS. We're, we're just following what we, what we have currently, is that the applicant typically will contact the uh, field office, will apply for a 135 uh, type certificate. The difference here is that right away the field office will, will involve headquarters that's a difference from the normal process. And then we will uh, have a, more of a, a group certification project rather than just one inspector or one team in the field. And the idea is, and this has been proven, I guess, 800 few years back, did a, uh, a Part 137 project in the same manner. An ag agriculture operator applied using UAS, and they followed the guidance that we have. But what we're doing, like they did, we will uh, update the guidance. We'll, we'll request deviation from whatever existing guidance that we have that doesn't apply. We, we have a process for that. And also, the applicant will have to learn about what they're proposing and what's existing in terms of regulations. And they would have to decide that which regulation they can comply with, which, which one they can't, which one does not apply. And then we'll go through the exemptions process. So they will have to. <coughs> Uh, give us a list or identify the rules that will not be uh, applicable or cannot be complied with. So with the regulations, the guidance, our inspectors also will be helping us draft new guidance, new ACs, advisory circulars for the public. So hopefully if we get to a complete one project, we haven't yet, we kind of just starting right now, by the end of, of a project under 135, we will have an idea, first of all, can it be done under the existing set of rules? Or is it more practical to forget 135 and have a 136 and a half or something like that, or 108.6, whatever? Something new that applies to uh, UAS, because most of the regs right now deal with man requirements, you know, oxygen. When you're flying above 10,000 feet, you must wear oxygen. Well, this, this is not going to, unless, unless, there's a possibility if we have a, an optionally piloted aircraft where it's a combination between uh, remote and um, manned. So that's the process. We, uh, we already identified a few miscellaneous things that we know we need some research requirements on, such as when you get into the air carrier business, we have uh, flight crew and duty uh, rest requirements, fatigue research fatigue requirements beyond what the manned uh, research has done already. An operator sitting in a, you know, control position on the ground, is there any fatigue related to that? Similar to maybe an air traffic controller or something like that, although it's not the same. Training, uh, how much um, stick and rudder skills do you need? It depends on the type of aircraft. Again, I'm not sure what we're gonna end up with from the aircraft certification side that operators will use in air transportation, but it depends on the platform that they're proposing. We may have a combination of, uh, you know, knowledge and skills or even just knowledge. And I'm talking above the 55 point uh, pound level. When we get into uh, a expanded type operations in the NAS, uh, non-segregated, uh, you may have, you know, all the way up to fully autonomous and automatic type operation where it does not need any uh, skills. Uh, fully auto land, auto takeoff, push a button and it'll fly from point A to point B. But it will require responsiveness like um, the folks from Next Gen mentioned that, you know, if, if you have a contingency, uh, you, you don't need to fly the aircraft, but you need to respond to air traffic uh, instructions. So what some of those are identified and we have a, a list of, you know, uh, bullets that we were working with the AUS office on. However, what we're going to do in the future or in the near future, before next week, I guess, we're going to have to think about bundling them together, maybe to have at least two or three bullets 
and we will focus on those requirements for the next couple years, FY 18, 19. In the meantime, we're watching what's happening on this side, and then hopefully in dog years, what, three years, I'll be gone. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> we'll have a better idea. So <laughs> thank you for uh, having me here. Thank you, Bill. And uh, looking forward to your questions or suggestions. Thanks. Yeah, I'd say um, right now, uh, first of all, thank you, everybody. That's, that's a, a good overview to get things started. Um, looking at the clock, it is uh, um, about 10 minutes to noon. Um, so I suggest that we um, go ahead and uh, start the, the Q&A with the Human Factors panel. Uh, and then what we'll do is continue this uh, in our last session, because all of you will be involved in the, the last session of the day. The difference will be these guys won't be around to, to necessarily hear it. Maybe some of you will. But, um, but we can at least get the questions uh, to them and address them uh, if you're not involved in, in the other ones. And, uh, and I guess we should also be mindful because uh, Wes has to leave after this, I think. Uh, so, um, he also yeah. Manages. And Kathy wants to say something. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to remind everybody, um, although the focus of this uh, discussion seems to be on human factors research, there's more to human factors than research. There's application of the knowledge that comes out of the research and the basic knowledge and science and engineering that we have from human factors. And I just wanted to make sure that we keep that in mind because the kind of human factors support, and we'll talk about this later, is not just research support, although that's critical. It's also the human factors practice and implementation to be a part of that implementation in our policy, our guidance, and so on. That's part of the reason we have people in AVS who are not just researchers or who are not researchers at all in human factors. So we need both. And so I would ask that some of the discussion take that into account. Phil, do you want to start? You go ahead. Uh, I, I think both Everett and, and Kathy were mentioning this safety continuum. And to me, one of the big issues that we have to be worried about is sort of the trade-off between safety and efficiency in the sense that if we look at, say, the uh, Metroplex, uh, uh, RNAV sorts of programs, what we in many cases have seen, a, a program that had efficiency goals didn't struggled to achieve them because the operators went beyond what the procedure said in terms of building in safety buffers. And I think that's a much less, imp uh, less what we're trying to deal with now is much more challenging than that in terms of saying whether it's in terms of technology, whether it's in terms of procedures, whether it's in terms of roles and responsibilities. Um, what people will really do may not match what the procedures say in terms of these safety buffers. And, and so, so I'm, I'm less looking at the issue of, of not equal safety for, say, small, in some sense I think you're implying, for some small operations versus large operations, but rather that there's going to be this trade-off trade where if we don't think about the human factors from a systems perspective, how does the pilot's behavior influence what the controller, sh what we should do in terms of airspace design so the controller's behavior is efficient, and that sort of systems view becomes a critical issue that human factors is part of, and then just any thoughts you have on, on how do we approach that so that we don't, don't design for our, sort of the stovepipe part of it. Here's something that looks good in terms of, of uh, ground control workstation design, but in terms of the behaviors it produces ultimately leads to uh, a failure of, of the efficiency goals or, in some cases, um, failure of a safety goal. Um, go ahead. Well, uh, I'll just kind of talk, you know, and, and I appreciate um, the, the comments about the you know, not just about the safety continuum, but also human factors from an application standpoint. And I'm not sure we do that very well. Um, you know, I think, I think we, you know, and, and, and I'm interested to hear how, how Ely interprets it at, in AFS 200, but it, at least with my, what I've seen in our division, the work that you all do, trying to take that and actually turn it into implementation and turn it into policy every day. And, I, and, and maybe that's a, that's a result of several things. You know, we always have certain projects and things that get pushed up ahead of, um, 
of the things that, that we see as critical. But I think there's this disconnect between the, the research world and the work that you're doing, and now how do we capture that within our, our line of business and then turn that into real world application um, and, and policy and or incorporate it into regulations. There was mention about performance-based standards and things like that. We're, at least in 800, we're at very infant stage when it comes to developing these type of performance-based standards and integrating these type of things. We're, you know, now trying to trans transition from prescriptive to risk-based to performance-based things. So, so I think we need to do a way better job of doing that. I don't know if that does, it probably doesn't directly answer your question, but at least to me it goes to the things that we need to consider and the things that we need to improve on. And now we have this new, we, we don't even do that well in the, in the man world, right? We, we we're try, we try very hard, but I think now that we've got the UAS world, how do we now ensure that we, assure that we do that? And, um, and we almost have to because the technology and the operations and the, and the things that we even are sitting in our chairs now, it's going to way change in the next few years, right? So, so we've got to come up with a, a way of, of interacting in a way that, that allows us to grow and to develop so that, um, so that from, a, from a safety perspective, we capture these things and now from unmanned pilots and manned pilots not just operate safely in their own sphere, but now can grow in, in that, those operations can integrate safely. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and just uh, we're so lucky that this is such a new thing that we're working on that industry and research folks and uh, the uh, regulator, they're all in the same boat. You know, they're all working on the same uh, project to achieve a result. And, and also, uh, the FAA, uh, at least from what I've seen, has done a good job the last year or two refocusing this conversation strategically. And we have an implementation plan now that is going to be uh, finalized hopefully pretty soon. And uh, everybody is involved in that conversation within the FAA and even outside. And so uh, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, we're open to, you know, new concepts. So, you know, unlike, you know, the guidance and regulations that are 30, 40 years old, we're still applying them today. You know, some of them change, but a lot of them have not. Now we're talking brand new set of rules, brand new set of guidance, concepts of uh, certification and oversight and performance-based type, risk-based type uh, uh, aviation safety. So I think that's that's a luxury that we have right now. So we're uh, on on my side, uh, 200, the air transportation division, like 800. We're open and we're uh, open-minded. Uh, Wes, sorry, yeah. or Valerie. So I have a question that kind of follows on a little bit, maybe to what, what the tone of this is. There's a lot of innovation in industry, a lot of people bringing new ideas, looking at new ways of doing things. And I think that creates some challenges into what expectations should be as we design components of the overall system. So I came here and I need to leave to go back to RTCA where we're working on standards for a collision avoidance capability for UAS. They'll be finished by 2020. And as part of that, we have some human factors, types of requirements that we need to implement. But you know, in, in the manned world, there's part 25, part 23 standards of what a cockpit looks like, what an operator looks like. And having been in many ground stations and seeing a variety of, of displays that are reconfigurable, that are, the operators can move, get rid of, what, when should we expect or should we expect guidance from um, the aircraft certification directorate, from AR 130, from flight standards? on what we should expect as a baseline capability or baseline expectation as we develop these systems? Or will we expect that at all? I mean, this has implications when we have a MOPS that's due in 2020, clearly we're late for research, we rely, like Kathy said, on experience, but we need to have some common understanding or even what level of risk we should be mitigating in the system design. And should we partition that to the pilots or the operators or to the system? And do we have expectations on a ground control station standard or a pilot standard 
for let's 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 scope this into the mid to larger size UAS. So I'll just um, quickly address at least part of your question. Um, we in aircraft cert, you know, recognized um, back when Steve was talking about when some of the UAS work was going on under Air 160 before it went over to the flight standard side of the house that there was a need to put together standards for the ground control stations and for you know those those core pieces of the unmanned systems and there was an effort under the 203 uh, SC 203 group to a little subgroup that was started up to look specifically at, at the ground station and the the, the control station uh, characteristics and so we have some guidance some white papers some information that came out of those studies um, some of that was published at least internally in a draft AC that we've created that is still kind of going around for some revisions um, there's the struggle of how much do we put out there to be prescriptive as a best practice document and how much do we allow to be sort of open to new ideas as you mentioned there's a sort of a, a continuum there of do we let everything be completely new or do we make people aware of the existing guidance and say follow what we know and so our at the the current time is is if the uh, ground control station looks like a typical uh, cockpit or, or or flight deck then we say follow some of the guidance and, and make sure you're aware of you know the existing uh, human factors and uh, the existing um, cockpit uh, design display design guidance um, if it's something that's a, a handheld controller that completely is something different um, then a lot of times those those uh, design characteristics don't really fit it's a square peg for a round hole kind of thing so those we have to be aware of you know basic color usage um, we have to do multi-pilot evaluations potentially of looking at those systems um, through our certification work so far we've run into this very issue where we had a, a handheld controller that had years of successful service and very demonstrable um, you know safety record that it was working well and yet there were a lot of things about that when we started evaluating it for our airworthiness and, and certification of it that didn't fit the bill and so we had to kind of go back and say okay we have to take a we have to back up one step and say is is what's there does it meet the intent of the safety goal which is a, an intuitive human machine interface sort of like some of the new language in the 1302 rule says you know make sure your in, your automation is is intuitive and easy to use well that's kind of the mindset we've taken with some of those uh, those evaluations of some of the handheld controllers that are outside the box um, but you know on the other spectrum is if it looks like a standard flight deck if a pilot you know a certified pilot's going to be flying the system then we we want them to adhere to the best practice as much as as, as practical so so Wes, I have a follow-up question on this topic. So yep. we're going to be um, going into FRAC for the final detect and avoid mops. Um, and we have assumptions about the ground control station capabilities because we were not writing mops for the ground control station. We were writing mops for the detect and avoid display. Right. So how do you, as the FAA and the, and the co-chairs involved with 228 and the policy that will come out as a result of the mops, make sure that they're aligned so that we don't have gaps. If we're making assumptions about what the control station can do, how are you ensuring that that's what the control station can do and that those MOPs are applicable to those ground control stations? It's a great question. So um, specifically for the MOPs and their applicability according to the terms of reference, those aircraft are most likely gonna be certified using what I would consider to be more traditional design characteristics for the control station because they're large high altitude aircraft they're you know remotely piloted where somebody's in the loop making sure that they are monitoring and um, you know so from my perspective I believe that the mops will fit well with you know the existing guidance and the assumptions that you've used for those terms of reference the challenge of course will be as the next phase comes online and we start looking at other types of UAS operations maybe lower altitude smaller aircraft those kinds of things uh, the that challenge, you know, we'll have to make sure those assumptions still hold true. So, Steve, I don't know if you have any yeah, comments think, on that. I think that's exactly right. One of the one of the challenges I already mentioned with with 228 is we did not stop. We did not start with a mast. We don't have a you know, aviation system view. You know, we were going to you know just build me, build me these two pieces of equipment so that we do have the. Uh, both the TSO and the advisory circular concerning both DAA 
and command and control are on the business plan for next year for for 17 so those will be those will be out and i think i think the other thing that's key is i make sure to attend wes's coordination meetings to make sure that i keep the 22h um, call out in in wes's overarching ac so wes has an overarching ac for all of uas and that ties in and recognizes the 228 work, but certainly there's work above that. And in phase two, we speak more to that in that we have we have a little bit of a mass flavor to decide what we're doing for SATCOM, but people in general are very leery, you know, build me a scale model of the NAS. Well, bring me a piece of paper the size of the NAS and I'll get started, you know, and see at you uh, the fidelity of the model is always is always hard for us. Um, so my question is relatively about the uh, risk-based certification issue, and um, perhaps this is, wasn't the way you wanted to go with it. But uh, to me, uh, it seems like we're focusing so far on. Uh, size as uh, as a driver of what the certification standards should be uh, particularly well for for instance for for the controllers for the control system that is yes. um, uh, when it's small you use a handheld when it's big you use a control station uh, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the the way we should do it um, I'm wondering how much uh, if anyone has, has thought about uh, looking at the, the application of the systems um, as, a, as at least part of the driver for the certification requirements in the control station, uh, and maybe some other factors too. But yep. Yeah, so I can start to address that, and then I'll, I'll pass it on. But um, in the draft AC that we created, um, we recognized right off the bat that weight, you know, is not the best weight, size, speed, you know, all these parameters are, it's a very difficult thing to sort of classify UAS and try to put a risk category associated with those. And we made an attempt of that using energy because we figured, well, okay, if it's, if it's large and fast and can do a lot of damage to things on the ground or to other aircraft, we want to apply a high level of certification to it. If it's small, you know, low energy and, and is going to bounce off of something, if it hits it, then, you know, we don't really have a high level of risk or worry from the FAA standpoint of integrating those into the NAS. Um, but to address your question directly, um, we absolutely believe that, you know, you have to take into account the concept of operation, type of aircraft, its intended mission, and where it's going to fly, the type of airspace, to have a complete understanding of what the design requirements should be. And it's been a great learning experience for me because I was looking at things two years ago when we wrote the draft AC. Um, from a very aircraft certification centric mindset, which was speed, altitude, weight, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And I've, I've gotten my education of airspace integration and thinking of this problem from the term of, of how they integrate into the NAS. And so I'm starting to think more on, on the lines of the first panel this morning where we have either segregated or integrated operations. And that's playing a part of the puzzle now. So one of my first decision points in the revision that we're going to do to the, the AC will be, is it a segregated operation or is it an integrated operation? And if so, that is really two separate decision trees to go down. And then underneath that, we would have this similar sort of classification scheme that we've been using where if it's a high-risk operation or high-risk large aircraft, we'll apply a heavier hand. If it's a you know low-risk light aircraft that's not going to hurt anyone, we'll take a light touch to it. Is, I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts on that. Uh, just quickly, just, you know, from a flight standards perspective, you know, three words come to mind, and that's uh, crawl, walk, and run. Mm -hmm. So right now we're in the, very much in the crawl stage. And um, so when it, for, for and, I'll, and I'll just use, keep using 107 as the, as the basis, but, you know, we, we had the, the proposed rule, which was basically the way, the way we started. So, you know, we, we really couldn't go beyond that at that stage and even operations over people and these type of expanded operations where there was a lot of willingness especially from industry to push that as far as you could go 
to get more performance-based um, in that rule, to expand the operations beyond what in the crawl stage. But we really, because of the, the, the time and the pressure and other things to try to get that rule out to enable the operations, we kind of had to stay in that box. And so, you know, a lot of the hard decisions, we kind of kicked down the road to the next, to the next rulemaking effort. So from a, from a Part 107 perspective, you know, the, the operations over people, the um, anything beyond visual line of sight was all kind of pushed next. So, um, you know, within, within our rule, the, the weight and these very prescriptive speed um, and altitude things and just making sure that you stayed segregated from the, the manned um, community except in specific instances was the, was the key um, and, and really just kind of had to, had to stay in that box um, for, for time and for, for reasons of, of just plain experience. We have to do this level now and then see what we've got, because we really have no idea what we're gonna have after August 29th. And then we'll be able to use that experience to move, to move forward into some of the more advanced thinking. So, so as you move forward, um, I think it'd be good to uh, have a process for how we can engage uh, to address your needs. Um, and so maybe we can, something for everybody to think about but um, you know, there's a lot of ideas about you know, and you guys mentioning that yes, we need this and that. I don't see a, a um, you know, we have our usual research processes and other processes, but but for general application support in general for human factors, uh, it's not clear to me how we kind of engage in your world. So, so maybe uh, you can have some ideas about. It. We don't have time to talk about it now, uh, but uh, we're running over now, so we should probably cut this. But uh, uh, everything you guys heard today, uh, let's let's follow up in the last session. You know, we're we're going to have all of you involved, except for Wes, he has to go um, in the last session too uh, today. So um, keep that in mind, and uh, I'll just put an action item for you guys to think about how we can get engaged in your needs. Uh, anything else, Kathy, or any quick no, closing remarks? Fine. No, I think that's fine. But let's. Let's do have the follow-on discussions, especially this afternoon and in the last session. Okay, so this concludes panel two. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists here. Uh, and to all of you in the front row uh, who will be uh, joining us again uh, later in the day.